Okay, well, welcome families. Super excited for you all to be here today. I'm um, gonna give you all some seconds and moments to get started and to jump in here. Um, we are super excited for you to be here today. And so we know um, that um, this is our, our, this is part of our Family You Chat series. And so what we do is we meet with campus partners to give you a really good opportunity to hear what they have to say um, and how their work impacts um, your students' experience. And so um, today I am joined um, by Diane and um, she is the Director of Substance Abuse and Prevention Strategy. And so she's gonna tell you a little bit more about what she does and how that impacts the, the, the life cycle of your student. Um, as always, all of these are recorded, and so you'll be able to view these on our YouTube, on our website, and our Facebook, um, so that you can go back and view it or share it with your student. And so I'm really excited for you all to be here with us today. And without me talking anymore, I'm going to turn it over to Diane. Uh, thank you so much, Jonathan. Thank you so much for having me and being able to talk with um, family members, with, with caregivers, with supporters, such a, a great opportunity. And on this important topic, I mean, I feel like it's important because it's like what I do, but um, but I, I hope that um, you all, uh, as you're coming in, I feel a little bit like romper room, like I see Linda and I see Shannon. And um, I can't use usually my cultural references anymore because I'm too old, but maybe you all like understood my cultural reference of romper room. Um, but uh, I can't see your faces. So maybe you're cracking up and, and laughing and maybe you're not. Um, so we'll, we'll see how that goes. Um, uh, but uh, it is really uh, a pleasure to be able to be here and have this conversation around the influences that family members have on students' use of alcohol and or other drugs. I have some information that I want to share and I also want to have kind of a conversation. And I know it's a little bit tricky when we're on this kind of format. So I'm going to encourage you all, please use that chat. Um, Jonathan is going to help uh, us monitor that. So I would, as we go along, I'm going to really encourage you to use this chat. So a little bit about me. My name is Diane Fedorchak. I am the Director of Substance Misuse Prevention and Strategy here at UMass Amherst. I've been on campus for 23 years. Um, I've been working with students across a whole host of health promotion issues in my career here at UMass Amherst um, that are salient to students' health and well-being um, as, as it pertains to college life. Right now, I get to do what I really love to do, which is really, really, really focus on substances. And I focus on the whole continuum of substance, um, non-use, use, misuse, chaotic use, substance use disorders, figuring out if they have a substance use disorder, and then providing services for those students who do have a substance use disorder and also recovery. Um, and I love to work with students across that entire spectrum. So um, that is a little bit about me. I, I do um, wanna just hold a candle and remember for a moment that when we talk about substances, substances really touch so many of our lives in so many different ways. And I I, I just attended a memorial yesterday for a, a, a young person that we lost due to um due to substances. And uh <clears throat> and I know how deeply this topic can really impact us. Um so I, I always start these presentations by remembering those that we have loved and lost along the way knowing that I'm not usually the only one in a room, even with a small number of people, I, I don't think that I'm the only one who has been impacted by somebody losing somebody that I care about and or being impacted by myself or somebody else's use that is still alive. So I really, I really want to want to hold that and make space for you and your hearts in, in this. So with that, I would love to hear from you all. And the mechanism we have in this space is drop it in the chat. <laughs> I would love to hear um, from you all by dropping it in the chat, which is something I never said before and something now we say on Zoom land. Um, drop in the chat here. What are concern, some concerns that you have about alcohol and or other drug use 
at here at UMass Amherst. Um, and if you don't have a concern, what, what brought you to this webinar? So a little bit of an open invitation to share with us either, you know, why did you join this webinar? And or if you have a concern, what are, what are your concerns you have? Thank you so much for jumping right in there. So if a student is feeling sick from drinking, should they feel safe being in their dorm bathroom? My student heard of someone being written up for that. So um, what a great question, thank you. And um, that, that is a, a great place to be and start. And, and I have things that I wanna go through, but we'll also go through it all too as, as the issues come up. So if someone is sick and in their dorm, yes, they should be, if they're in their, in their residence hall, they should go and, and, and be ill. Um, please know that we do have community members. We have student leaders that are trained to look out for their peers. So we do have students who are sick in the bathroom from either just eating a bad taco or a virus or being intoxicated. And we do have trained leaders to go in there and make sure that they're okay, whatever they're sick from. And if a student is intoxicated and they are underage, they, they, they might in fact need other assistance. Um, they might be so sick that they might need other care. Um, and if that were the case, and those student leaders are trained on how to do that. Some of our care is, um, comes in the form of our policies and in, in form of our interventions. Um, so yes, we have had students that are written up because they are extremely sick in the bathroom. They are extremely intoxicated. They need a check. They, they need a, a, a check to check on their, their well-being. And sometimes those students need medical attention to, to deem them okay or not to be left on their own or to go back to their residence hall. If that happens, that student who is ill may be written up because we're gonna to try to get them to the next level of care, next level of intervention. And for those students, it's usually coming to see one of my staff um, in the basics program, um, where they're gonna have a conversation about, oh, tell me about your drinking. Tell me about your substance use. What's good about it? What do you get out of it? What's not so good about it? What do you not wanna get out of it? When do you get the good things out of the drinking? And when do you get the not so good things out of the drinking? All of our programs are based in harm reduction. And in harm reduction, it says that harm reduction states that we support people who don't do the behavior, whatever the behavior is, whether it's um, drinking, whether it's other drug use, whether it's sex, whether it's um, whatever it might be. Um, and if somebody chooses to do that thing, how do we do that more safely? And how do we help them do that more safely? If I choose to be out in the sun on the beach, how do I do that more safely? putting on sunscreen, getting under umbrella after a certain period of time, putting a hat on, right? If I choose to drive in a car, how do I do that more safely? Putting a seatbelt on, going the speed limit, not um, being exhausted while I'm driving and all. It's a similar thing with alcohol. It's illegal to do so if you are 21, if you're under 21 and we see all the messages of um, not doing so. And if you choose to do so, how do you do that more safely? And then helping students figure out their ways of doing that more safely. So if a student is written up, then they will come to one of our staff people and, and have that conversation, you know? And a lot of students will have different strategies for doing that safer because most of our students don't want to drink to the point of throwing up from drinking. Um, that is a not so good experience that some of our students have. And they say, oh my goodness, when I drink six drinks, that's when I puke. Um, but when I have two or three drinks, I don't usually throw up and we help them figure that out for themselves. So depending on the situation, a student could get written up. Um, what that will do is have them enter into a system that is, a, that is built around care and support that is built within policies that are with a public health approach to how do we identify students who might be doing something that might put them in a little bit more danger and how do we um, provide them uh, some support to make some different and healthier decisions. I hope that answered that question and if you have more comments, please put them in the chat. Our next person wants to know, uh, just wanna know what I should bring up if I'm concerned about drinking. Oh, thank you. But do trust my son, excellent. Don't wanna push him away, but we do have history of addiction in the family. Thank you. If you do have a history of a substance use disorder in your family, talking about that is so important. Um, 
I am of the belief that you're never too young to talk about it. Um, and I'm like, uh, my, my kid is young. I, I'm an old parent with a young kid. Um, she's going to be nine next month. I mean, we have talked about the history of substance use disorders in our family. Well, forever, um, for, uh, since, since she was prenatal basically and, and throughout her whole life. And there's ways that we can talk about that age appropriately. So the fact that you are talking to your, your son about um, the, the history in your family, excellent. So keep talking about that because we know that if you have a history of a substance use disorder in your family, it does put somebody at higher risk for a substance use disorder. So excellent to do that. And you want him off on the right tra track, definitely. I believe he thinks some moderations, but don't want it to get bad. Um, yeah, that... That is um, spot on. So here's what I can uh, say on that. And I'm gonna advance my slides a few slides here to this and I'll back it up in a minute, but I just wanna meet you where you're at, just like I meet your students where they're at. Um, what I would say to your, your students here, well, what I would say to you is what I just started with, which is keep talking, talk with them. Um, we find that caregivers often underestimate your role in your student's life once they've left for college. And in fact, the literature shows and the research shows over and over and over again that you as parents and caregivers continue to exert an influential role even into late adolescent drinking behavior. And late adolescent, I mean, that goes to like 25, right? So you still have um, an influential role. Your students do care what you think. Even when you get the eye rolls and the, oh, mom, dad, and uncle, oh, grandparent, I know, I know. Um, they do care what you think and they are listening. Um, and uh, our students tell us that. They tell us that they are listening to you. Um, they tell us that they care what you think. And the research shows that as well. So some tips, keep keep talking. Um, I will also uh, say that perceived caregiver approval is associated with students' alcohol and other drug-related problems. What that means is if your student perceives that you think it's okay for them to drink, they have a higher chance of having related problems due to alcohol and other drugs. So by the nature of your question, you know, you saying your son and talking about your family, um, uh, your family history is really important. By you setting family values and what your family values is really important. By you saying, you know, um, you know, we expect you not to drink if you're under 21. And if you do, what are some ways that you can do that safer is really, really important. Setting expectations for your student is important. Setting clear expectations. If your student's an A student in high school, then expecting A's and B's in college makes sense. If your student's a B student in high school, accepting, you know, B's in, in college, you know, setting those expectations and, and clear expectations is really, really helpful. Um, I do want you to know that the research continues to be clear that, um, even if you don't say that you give permissive permission, it is the perceived permission. I have so many students that I sit with and they say, oh yeah, you know, my parents, they're, they're fine or my caregivers are fine um, with me drinking as long as I don't do anything stupid. And when I unpack that with them, so many times what they translate that to is don't drink and drive. Which is, oh my gosh, that's a great, that's, that's a great lesson, right? Like, don't drink and drive. Excellent. And there's a whole lot of stupid between here and don't drink and drive that can happen. So really being clear with your students is really, really important. And having that open space for dialogue, making space for them to talk is really important. Um, and I know with my own kid, I, I need more than me and my partner on her team. You know, I want her, her, 
chosen family. I want her um, her extended family to be able to ask her questions and talk about it. I want her dance teachers to be checking in at some point, like maybe not now they're not, but as she gets older and is a preteen and is, an, is a teenager and they know her really well and they spend a lot of time, I want her talking about being able to talk about this at school. Having way more people in the community that can hold these conversations is important. Because you know what? These kids are talking about it anyway. My kid in first grade came home and told us about um, a new friend that she made and that that new friend's parent struggles with being drunk. Those were her words um, because that her friend needed to talk about it with somebody and they were in first grade. They're six years old, right? Like these kids were talking about it anyway. So to be able to support my kid and holding that to then support her friend, um, it, it, it matters, you know, it really matters. Um, so hopefully that's a little helpful as we move along. And, and as your students get older and as they approach closer to 21, the literature shows us that students um, tend to look at your, your behavior to guide their own drinking. So it might it's a little bit less about what you say and a little bit more about the modeling. Um, so being open, talking about it, setting clear expectations um, is, is, really, is really helpful. Um, my chat. Um, great. Seems like I'm, I'm answering that, you know, um, also like, um, I guess I want to go back to this, uh, a little bit about why we care about substance, um, misuse and why these conversations are important. And, um, and yes, trust in your kid. Totally get that. And how keeping these conversations going are important because alcohol is the number one misused drug on college campuses. It just is. Um, a new report came out um, about health, alcohol, and safety in Massachusetts. Um, came out just recently um, from Boston University School of Public Health. Um, and if you are uh, kind of dork out about this stuff like me and want this, um, I'll happily send it to you. I, um, if you are in state, I want you to know that Massachusetts ranks 14th highest among the states for binge drinking. That means um, females having four or more drinks at one time or males having five or more drinks at one time. That is the minimum threshold that gets us to start experiencing those not so good things. As we, as we drink more, than that, then the risk of us experiencing those not so good things become greater and the um, type of not so good things we experience become even greater. Um, so our young people are, are, our young people are also in our state are also drinking at higher rates than the national average. So um, there we go, Massachusetts, right? These are really important things to talk about. Um, we know that students who engage in four or five or more drinks are on a regular basis are more likely to report injuries they're more likely to engage in unplanned sexual encounters. Um, we know that students who drink in this manner are more likely to experience early departure from college, meaning they might stop out of college or drop out of college. They, they tend to have less favorable job prospects after college. We know that students who use marijuana more than several times um, are more likely to experience academic consequences. They might miss class more and are more likely to stop out of college. This is important for us and for me to work with my colleagues like Jonathan and his colleagues and colleagues all across campus to reduce high risk drinking. Um, and that that's like having, you know, five or more drinks on a regular basis, right? We're not talking about somebody who has one or two or three drinks, right? And I don't mean drinks like I fill this up with vodka and I drink it. <laughs> I mean, a 12 ounce beer, a one and a half ounce shot or a five ounce glass of wine. And we talk to students about what a drink is because this is not a drink. Um, uh, a, a handle of, uh, of uh, this with vodka is not a drink, right? So we talk about what a drink is. But students who drink um, five or more drinks are more likely to experience violence than students who don't drink in that manner. Um, um, and, it, and it has all sorts of financial implications as well. Um, unfortunately, we know that the negative impacts of substance abuse goes beyond academics. Unfortunately, across our country of, of college age students, these are national numbers. We have, we have over 1,519 students dying a year because of alcohol related events. That is 1,519 too many. 
we know the huge number of assaults and sexual assaults that are due to students drinking or sexual assaults that involve alcohol. And that is not to victim blame. That is to say that alcohol is involved in these. And if we can reduce high-risk drinking, we absolutely can reduce the number of sexual assaults on our college campuses. We have students going to hospital on, for alcohol overdose. We have injuries and so many other unreported consequences. So um, talking to your students is so, so very important on so many levels. My next slide was asking um, if you uh, if you believe as, as you as parents and caregivers continue to have an influential role over students drinking. And I was like, yeah, give me a thumbs up because I didn't realize we were going to be a webinar format and I thought I could see you, but I can only see myself. Um, but hopefully, hopefully now all of your thumbs would be up um, because hopefully you got the message that you do really do have um, a role in your student's life even after they take off for college. And um, if somebody could throw in the chat, when is when, at what age is our brain fully developed? By what age, developmentally, is that organ fully, the frontal lobe fully developed? I'll take advantage of you typing it in and I'll drink more coffee while you go. Thank you, 25 with a question mark, right on. Yeah, 25, 26, some of us, I'm still waiting. I'm still waiting for mine to really be fully developed. <laughs> that frontal lobe is the part, if you are not familiar with, that, that does decision-making, logical thinking, risk-taking. Oh my gosh, it's so beautiful that we as younger people take more risks, right? Like, I am not going to learn how to snowboard right now. I'm, I know the risks involved and I fall down. It's going to take a lot longer to stand back up. I will be hurt. I'll be hurt for much longer. Plus I pay my own healthcare insurance now, right? I'm not, um, and when I was younger, heck yeah, I'm going to learn how to do some different things, right? I got that risk. Like there's beautiful things in risk taking, and, you know, maybe some not so. And when we take a drug like alcohol that impacts our decision-making, logical thinking, and risk-taking that directly impacts the part of our brain that is not fully formed until we're about 25, 26 years old, that's a bit of a perfect storm. Um, so please know that you all have, the more we can get a student to um, wait till they're closer to 21 to drink, the less likely they are to develop a substance use disorder and the less likely they are to have negative consequences. The earlier a student drinks, um, the more likely they are. Students who, young people who drink at the age of 14, and I'm not talking just a little sip, I'm talking, you know, have a drink, at the age of 14 are five times more likely to, to develop a substance use disorder. So the longer we can wait to get them to start to to use substances, if they even choose to use, the better. And really talking about harm reduction strategies, um, if they do choose to drink, is really important. Having, like you have with your son, having that open communication so that they can come to you and that they can talk to you is really, 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 really important. So some further tips I have is asking open-ended questions about your young people's uses. Be responsive, you know, and be ready for what their answer is. Um, asking them once when they're 15, do you drink alcohol? No, okay, Woof. <laughs> that conversation's done. Well, what about when they're 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, right? So having that ongoing conversation. Um, and then if they do use talk of them, what do you hope to get out of it? What do you not hope to get out of it? How do you negotiate that? What are some what are some ways that you can get what you want out of it and not what you don't want out of it um, is really all important. Before my kid was born, we had to go to the doctor's office and pick a doctor. We chose a practice and they have all these doctors. They said, choose a doctor. And I said, well, choose a doctor. How do you do that? Go online, read their bios, and then come in and interview doctors. I'm like interview doctors, this is so weird, okay. So my partner and I went in and we met with a doctor and she talks all about the practice, fine, fine, fine. And then she says, um, you know, what questions do you have for us? Which is a great open-ended question, right? Because it's inviting questions. What questions do you have for us? And my partner had some questions, so great. And then the doctor looked at me and said, you know, do you have any questions? And I said, I do. I said, will you talk to our daughter about drug, sex, and alcohol? And I got really quiet for a moment and she just looked at me with this face 
And I said, will, will you talk to our daughter about drug, sex, and alcohol? And her, after I asked it a second time, she said, your daughter's not even born yet. And I laughed and I said, I know. I said, but when she is born and she comes in and she is able to talk and you are, she's in your practice. Do you have a practice of talking to young people about drugs, sex, and alcohol? Like, I'm not punking you. This is a real question. And she said, yes, we do. And I'm like, good answer, right? Um, and she went on and said, yes, when age appropriately, we will talk to them. We'll ask the caregivers to leave and we'll well, how this, I'm like, right, because I want everybody, you know, I wanted to make sure that the doctor that we chose for our kid is going to routinely bring this up because she might not talk to me, even when I bring it up, but she might talk to her doctor or her dance um, teacher or the janitor at school, right? Um, so keep talking. Um, I talked a little bit about being direct and setting high expectations and the reasons why, right? Um, we like to encourage Friday morning classes. <laughs> yes, have that eight o'clock, nine o'clock Friday morning class. Um, if your student's prone to drinking and um, will drink on Thursday nights, they'll be less likely to, you know, so, um, and, and, and be clear. Um, we also encourage caregivers to meet students up in their room. You know, um, knowing family will be or fr uh, family friends are visiting helps have a positive effects in the hallway environment. Um, oh, we got to clean up the space. You know, my aunt's coming up. My godparents coming up. My my foster mom's coming up. My grandparents coming up. My 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 mom's my dad's, um, so, you know, somebody's coming up. Right. Um, and then also take a notice about take a notice about what you see. Oh, hey son, daughter, um, non-binary child, they, them. Um, well, can I get a drink of water? That was a long drive. See what's in there, you know, there's little ways to see what's in their refrigerator, right? And just talk about what they see. Another tip is using everyday uh, events to talk about alcohol. Um, see, look, the, we started right off with family history. So thank you for that. And you could talk about alcohol related incidents in the media and in the media, there's lots of opportunity right now. There was so many, um, NPR stories recently about Narcan and, um, where there are Narcan vending machines. It's a really great time to talk about substances and Narcan and fentanyl and our drug supply. I could talk about that in a little bit, if you're interested in that. Um, right now, gambling is being talked about more and more and more. And NPR was just running a series on on gambling as sports betting is is more and more popular well it's just made legal in our state and is more and more popular and I just said to a student that I worked with in our recovery program we gotta we gotta re-up our gambling stuff we gotta dig that stuff back up and and um talk do that right uh and and oh I heard an NPR story I heard a podcast on I saw on this TV program right there's a gazillion ways that we could talk about everyday examples oh heck in my family with my kid it's like visiting our family and like yeah let's talk about what we just saw there let's unpack that a little bit you know um, and then we encourage you to um, keep a list of resources at home in case your student calls you and needs information, either for themselves or their friends. Because um, you know what? Most times they are going to call you. They're going to call you first or they're going to call their friends. <laughs> so we're also talking to students how to talk with other students. Um, I want to make a space for a moment here about what questions, what comments do you have? What came up for you in, in that time we just you just shared together. Um, it's okay if not. Um, I would love to ask you if you could you could type it in whenever. So please, that's an open invitation to. Um, Oh, any strategy if your your student gets defensive? Thank you. That's um, that's great. Um, students. Uh, yeah, all the different reasons why students might get defensive. Um, why might they? Sometimes it hits a little too close to home for them. Sometimes they're not ready um to talk about it. When when we have students who get a little defensive here in our our program, um, my work with the with the staff that I work with is. How do you shift your strategy? I might name it. I might say, ooh, it feels like you're getting a little defensive here. What's coming up for you? Open-ended, bless you, open-ended question. Um, what's coming up for you? Um, it seems like maybe now's not a good time to talk about it. Would there be a better time to talk about it? 
Maybe you don't want to talk about it with me. Do you have other people in your life that you could talk about this with? Or who are other people in your life and in your support system who you could talk about this with? Right. So I would name it a little bit and then ask because it, it, there might be lots of different reasons for them getting defensive. So when I hit defensiveness with students that I'm working with or resistance um, that I'm working with or my own kid, it is a reminder about any topic. It is a reminder for me to change my strategy. Um, and, and sometimes it's to regulate myself and to notice it and then ask some more open-ended questions. Um, and then also to see who else my, the student that I'm working with, who else is on their support system? Do they have a support network? Do they have a support team? Really great question. Um, as we're doing that and you're typing in more, I'd love for you to name a couple of strategies that students, uh, anybody, anybody, um, anybody who uses substances can do in order to mitigate the negative consequences. What are some strategies somebody can use to mitigate the negative consequences from substances? Exercise, yes, exercise. You do kick up those endorphins, don't you? Absolutely. Um, especially if people are struggling not to use or whatnot, or what are they, um, uh, how to keep from using or minimize using. Yeah, kick up those endorphins, go for a walk, connect with friends, definitely. Um, so I love this little mouse, this little mouse, and it's this time of year where the mice start coming in my house. So that's like never a good thing. But this little mouse found wants to get that cheese. But if that mouse gets the cheese, you know, off with its head. Ugh. Um, but this uh, ingenious little one found a helmet. So now when it goes for the cheese, it's going to maybe get a concussion. Still a negative consequence, but not right. So if the mouse doesn't go for the cheese, if it doesn't drink, if it doesn't use marijuana, if it doesn't use cocaine, if it doesn't use prescription medicine or ER or other pills or ecstasy or heroin, um, it won't, you know, have those negative consequences. If it does any of those things, what are what's the helmet that they can use? So what are some of the harm reduction approaches? You know, for drinking, set a limit. Set a number of limits, like explore. We're, we'll be exploring with different students what their limits are. For some students, honestly, a limit is six. You know, for other students, the limit's four or two or not drinking because of using. Set a limit of how many days a week. Um, set a limit of how many joints they smoke or how often they do their substances or doing one substance at a time and not combining them. Maybe just I'm drinking tonight and not drinking and smoking. Um, I know it sounds whatnot, but those are harm reduction uh, strategies. If we're using alcohol, alternating water with alcohol, with alcohol, it helps us pace, pace out our drinks. Um, it helps us stay hydrated um, and um, uh, keeping track. So if I set a limit, then I need to keep track of how many I'm uh, using so that I know when I get to the number. Bring a set amount of money. Use a sober driver. Sober driver is not the least drunk person at the end of the night is the one who has not been using any, any, any substances, including marijuana. Um, so we talk about lots of, and there are many more harm reduction strategies. We talk about lots of harm reduction strategies when we talk about alcohol, when we talk about marijuana, we talk about knowing the THC, the, um, the, uh, the amount of substance in the marijuana that gets us high, knowing how much it is, knowing to go low and slow, meaning use a lower amount of THC and go slow. Sometimes new users do not understand how much of that THC is in that marijuana. Look, when I was coming up of age in the um, 80s and all, the the, the amount of THC in marijuana was 4%. Um, we called it grass because guess what? It basically was grass. The amount of THC in our marijuana these days across our country is guess how much? Just say in your head, say out loud, guess how much um, the, the amount of the substance in the marijuana today 
the, the, the active ingredient that gets the active chemical that gets us high, guess how much it is in, in our uh, supply these days? It's on average 13, 13%. So I'm not a mathematician, but I know that 13 is way more than four. And in states that have legalized adult use marijuana, like Massachusetts, we tend to see even higher rates of THC in those dispensaries, upwards to 20, 23% THC. And you can get all sorts of cannabis that has all different ranges of THC, but we tend to see lots higher rates, uh, percentages. So 23 is way higher than four, y'all. It's a different substance than it was in the 70s, 80s, even early 90s. And we have way many way, way, new ways to use it, right? Like um, all the um, edibles and stuff, what, what people don't know and, and um, novice users don't know is that when it takes about a half an hour to 45 minutes when I take an edible to feel the effects because of the way the cannabis is, um, is uh, goes through our body. So if I take in a gummy bear and I chew it, or I take a piece of candy bar and I eat it, and, and the dose is a tenth of a candy bar. Has anybody ever eaten a tenth of a candy bar on this call? Because I'll tell you what, even the candy bars that I can't stand that are like the 100% like cacao or whatever, like even though it's a, the extreme dark chocolate that my partner eats and I'm like, ew, I don't like those. I still have never eaten a tenth because when I bite, bite into one of those, I really need the chocolate, right? So you take a tenth of it and I'm like, Whew, okay, I don't feel anything. I know myself. I don't feel anything. I'm going to take another, I'm going to take another tenth. And I still don't feel anything. I'm going to take another tenth. I still don't feel anything. A uh, half an hour, 45 minutes haven't gone by. I totally know myself. I'm totally taking a fourth one. By the time that kicks in, I have taken four times the dose that I should be taken. And it has a way different impact on my body and my mind. Um, so harm reduction, go low and go slow. Take that temp and wait, wait an hour, see what happens. So there's lots and lots and lots of education to be done about this. Um, I'm still looking for questions or comments. Um, I do have some stuff um, <clears throat> and we've been talking a, a lot about Narcan these days um, here at UMass Amherst. Um, I, I wanna, I, I do, I would love to talk a little bit about Narcan if that is something that is of interest to you all. And I also want to make space though for some questions and um, some comments about this, about this section that we just talked about around um, alcohol and, and marijuana some. So I'll give it a moment. The invitation is there, so please, um, please join. Um, <clears throat> I am working in in partnership right now. Uh, I just put some quick slides on here, so I don't have them all, but I'll talk through it all. But I've been working in partnership with my colleague, Dr. Ann Becker, um, at the Public Health Promotion Center. Uh, Dr. Becker is our public health nurse. Um, she she and her team did all things uh, COVID during our COVID time, um, and they do vaccinations and they do flu clinics and they do STI sexually transmitted infection um, uh, clinics and all and and they're just really a fantastic team to work with and Anne is just a, an amazing colleague to work with and and we partnered up and um, worked really hard to get Narcan so that we can really develop a program to bring to UMass Amherst to really reduce shame and stigma and increase access to care. And we worked all last year on this and it took a long time for us to be able to procure enough, nar or to procure the Narcan. Um, we have had Narcan available in our um, pharmacy here at University Health Services for many a years now, since the governor uh, many a years ago made um, made a standing prescription order that anybody can go to their pharmacist and get Narcan without a prescription. Um, and it would just go onto your insurance. Um, we've had that in our pharmacy. Um, medical uh, emergency services has always, always, always carried Narcan. Narcan is not a new drug. It's been around in our states. Uh, our, our emergency 
um, personnel in this country have been using it for 40 years. Um, our hospitals have been using this medication for, for over 40 years. So this is not a new medication. What is new about it is um, the widespread availability made uh, possible due to the overwhelming opioid crisis. I mean, 2017, um, uh, the federal government declared an opioid crisis, like just declared a national emergency. We're having a, a national emergency crisis. In 2017, we had about uh, 60 to 70,000 people across our country dying directly due to an opioid overdose. And wow, that's a lot. And why did that happen? Um, a lot of factors and this one partic particularly particularly caused by um, the pharmaceutical industry. There is an amazing documentary done by Hulu called Dope Sick. I highly recommend it. It really lays out clearly. It's about, I think it's four or five episodes, lays out so clearly um, uh, Purdue Pharma's role in this epidemic. Um, and if you're not enraged already, this will have you enraged. If you're a person who's like, I can't understand why people use these substances, um, this will help shed a little bit of light on a partic on particular paths. Um, it's a little hard to watch and I, I do encourage you to, to check it out. Um, so we have way too many people dying. Let's fast forward uh, the number of, of 60,000 people dying in 2017 when we declared it a national emergency to today. Today, across our country, we have over 100,000 people dying because of opioids a year. In the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, excuse me, in our state, I mean, in our country, in our country, two, uh, a 1,000 people dying a year translates to one death every five minutes. In the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, the numbers equal one, excuse me, the numbers equal six deaths every day in the state of Massachusetts due to opioid overdoses. I just went yesterday to a memorial for a friend and colleague's son who died of an overdose. Again, my candle burning, my proverbial candle is burning because, um, because this touches us in so many ways. So partnering with Anne um, to, to be able to talk about this, to be able to decrease stigma and shame and increase access to care because this has wide, wide reaching um, uh, implications here. Our drug supply is loaded with fentanyl. Why those, why that extreme jump in numbers is because our drug supply has been infiltrated with a uh, um, a synthetic opioid, meaning a person-made opioid called fentanyl. Fentanyl is really cheap. It is easy to make. It is extremely strong. Um, the amount of fentanyl that can fit on the tip of my pencil is a potentially lethal dose. Um, drug makers, in order to make uh, heroin, you need poppies. And you need lots of poppies and poppies grow in the dirt. You need dirt and soil. And if it rains too much or doesn't rain enough, that impacts your crops. If it um, frosts, if it whatever, you can only grow so much, but you can make an unlimited supply of fentanyl and you only need a little bit to get high. So you need much less of the drug. It's easy to make, it's cheap, it's easy to transfer. Um, so our drug supply is loaded with this stuff. When we buy pills out on the street, counterfeit pills, ecstasy, those kind of things are just counterfeit pills. Um, six out of 10 pills out there have a um, have fentanyl in them. Most of our overdose deaths are because there's fentanyl. And there's fentanyl not just in our heroin, but also in our cocaine and in our other drug supply. So why do we talk about Narcan? Because Narcan, which is the, the brand name is Naloxone. Uh, Narcan is, excuse me, is the brand name for Naloxone. So it's kind of like Kleenex tissues. Um, it's a medication used to reserve, reverse an opioid overdose. So what happens is we take an opioid or we take cocaine, which is not an opioid, but that has fentanyl in it, because a lot of our cocaine now does. The opioids get on these brain receptors. It slows our breathing down and we can go into an overdose, which means we're not breathing anymore. We could die. Um, it binds to the receptors. What happens is if we could get Narcan in on time, it takes the opioids and kicks them off those receptors and blocks the receptors. So now the person can breathe. 
Um, it's easy to administer and it requires no formal training. It works um, within seconds to minutes. If it doesn't work within three minutes, we say to people, use another dose. Um, uh, we always call 911 because the person, you might find a person that is um, not being woken up and they might have um, opioids in their system. And if it does, hopefully one or two doses will work. If they don't have an opioid in their system, let's say they're drunk um, and they are unconscious because they are in alcohol poisoning, this won't work. So we need to call 911 and get somebody, uh, medical professionals there. This also won't hurt them. Or if they had a heart attack, you know, we don't know what they went down with. They Maybe they had a heart attack. This will not hurt them. But we want medical professionals there. If this does work and they come out of an overdose, well, they aren't always too happy because a person overdosing doesn't know that they're overdosing, doesn't know that they're actually dying. And when they come out, you just took them out of their, their drug-induced kind of coma, death-like state. They're not always too happy. So we want medical personnel there um, when that happens. We also want medical personnel there because Narcan lasts for about 30 to 90 minutes, depending on how many op how much opioid is in the system. So um, we want medical uh, help to arrive because they might go back into an overdose. So we, we have lots of signs. We have um, lots of ways um, and information on how to give opio um, give Narcan. We have ways like how do we, you know, what are some signs if we're with somebody that's using and we, our message is never use alone. The young person who died used alone. There was Narcan in the house that he used. He used alone. Um, if you're using with somebody or somebody's, you know, did a lot of cocaine or did some Molly, um, or did something else or did some weed with some that had some fentanyl in it or did some heroin. Um, if they're starting to get dizzy and disoriented, if they're making noises, if their lips or nails are starting to turn blue, if their eyes are looking really weird. Um, those are some signs of an overdose, like start an overdose is coming on. You need a 911 immediately. Um, if you come across a person, they cannot be woken and you do a little chest rub where under the nose rub and they cannot be woken um, and you suspect an overdose, you can use this Narcan, um, call, call 911. Um, how do you use it? Really simple. You, um, I didn't really plan on, on uh, all the way talking about this until the last minute. So, um, but I, I think any opportunity to talk about it is a good opportunity, but, um, and we're giving this to students right now by the hundreds. So it, ours is a nasal spray and it comes like this and you peel the back off. It's a nasal spray. So what do you do? You place it, where do you place it? Right in the nose and you press the, press the plunger. That's it. You peel it open, you place it in the nose and you press the plunger and you call 911. Always calling 911. Um, again, our program, we're talking to lots of people across campus about this. I'm hearing story after story after story. Like I said, I was at a memorial yesterday. Um, so we want, we want, we want people to get help. We want people to get the resources that they need. Um, we work across the whole continuum here of care. Um, we want to get people here. This is our little river. It's our little analogy. Um, for those of you, for your, your kids who aren't using, we want to keep them not using, right? Whatever the substance is, run, keep them not using, whatever the thing is, right? How do we keep you not using and how do we create an environment? And we really work to work across the environment, across our campus, across our towns um, to keep people from not using, making the healthy choice, the easy choice. And if you want to get across that river and you do want to use, you want to do, do something, how do we make the safer choice, the easier choice? I mean, it might be, how do we keep policies in place to help people from, from overdoing it, right? Like how do we, maybe we even need to put up signs or, um, or, or put up a bridge, you know? Um, and when somebody does fall in the river and they do use, and they do get, like, this is the harm reduction stuff around counting your drinks, keeping it under a certain number, using with friends, looking out for each other, calling for help when needed. When somebody does fall into the, um, we have things on this end, like Alcohol ADU, all of your students had to, new students had to take an alcohol program that also addressed other substances before they even came in, that gave them the policies in, that were in place to help them make informed decisions, that gave them tips that if they choose to use, here are ways to do that safer. Having your involvement is really important 
important across this entire continuum. We do work with our campus and community coalition to reduce high risk drinking. We work with our partners across campus and the surrounding communities to, to span um, uh, interventions and programs and initiatives to keep our, our campus and our local surrounding communities safer. We have health communications and um, different ways that we communicate that support non-use of alcohol and other drugs. We have these overdose prevention and intervention trainings, um, some of which I just covered some of the material in it with you. Why? Because your student might not use, they might not use heroin, but maybe they're at a party and someone did a line of cocaine. Right, or they're at a party and somebody's unconscious from drinking. We want them to recognize these signs and, and jump in, or maybe they don't use any of it at all, but somebody had a, a surgery and now they have they got a prescription for opioids. Gosh, I had surgery recently and it's so hard to remember. Did I take my medicine or not? Right. Oh, I'll just take another dose. It's easy to kind of overdose, even on prescription medication. Um, so or my kid accidentally gets into it or somebody's kid accidentally gets into my medicine. Lots of reasons why we might want to carry this stuff. We are talking with faculty and staff so that they can be looking out for students so that if they so that we can help them not fall in the river. And if they fall in the river, how do we help it um, identify that early, earlier, so that we can just throw in a life buoy and kind of pull them out. Right? How do we get them before they fall off the waterfall there? We need everybody in our community, just like I need everybody in my kids' community. We need faculty and staff and main maintainers see stuff. You want to talk about kids throwing up in the bathroom, those maintainers see things because guess who cleans that up? Right? So how do we work with maintainers um, to help identify this too? They have, they have awesome connections with many of students. Many of our students are connected with our maintainers. Um, so really working across, how do we have caring conversations with our students, um, providing skills and really have early identification of students at risk. We also have health communications that support safer use of alcohol and other drugs. If you choose to use, how do you do so in safer ways? Um, we have availability of harm reduction supplies. And I'm talking, we have condoms and lubricants and face masks for, for if we're ill. We have Narcan, fentanyl testing strips. So the range of harm reduction supplies and talking about these things. I talked a little bit about when students get in trouble and get, get uh, reported. They go to our basics program, brief alcohol screening and intervention for college students. They have an opportunity to check in with staff in a non-confrontational, non-, -confrontational, non um, judgmental conversation about where they're at with their use and if they choose how to do that more safer and also to also help them with um, other resources on campus. We have this drinker's checkup that you can take just online and just check it up. Like, I wonder how my drinking is. I don't need to interact with anybody on staff. I could just do it on my phone. It takes just a few minutes and I get individualized feedback right away. Um, we do have a substance misuse consulting team. I work directly with our counseling center staff. I work with a provider here at, at University Health Services who does medis medicated assisted recovery. We have a provider that gives students Suboxone and works with them, gives Vivitrol for substance use disorder. We do have medicated assisted recovery. We have CCPH is our Center for Counseling and Psychological Health. Um, who work with students individually um, in groups and also in consultation with me and my other colleagues. And we have a wide range of um, UMass recovery initiatives supporting students figuring out, hey, is this thing jamming me up and what does that mean? And also students from recovery supporting each other. Um, we do have, uh, like I said, a Narcan uh, program and, and a distribution program. And our UMass recovery, we have recovery coaching. We have all, re all recovery meetings that supports and honors all pathways to recovery. We have weekly lunches and drop-ins. We have support for friends and family members who are impacted by substance use. We have fun social events that we do. They just went to Six Flags to Fright Fest and How to Blast, movie nights and um, watching football together. We help them uh, navigate resources on campus and across our community. They are part of our harm reduction ambassador program um, with our overdose education and Narcan distribution. Um, and we have outreach and education information. 
So lots of different ways for those students to get involved. We are a strong, proud, and connected community. Up in the corner, you see one of our students talking, one of our student leaders talking with a, a student who's trying to figure out their recovery path. We have celebrations. That picture there, it says 2023 UMass Recovery. That was from our graduation this, this past, uh, last, last uh, spring. It was beautiful. We have supports for students who are um, needing some support uh, because they're impacted by a family or friend's substance use. We want them to know that they're not alone. And we want students to know that um, Narcan saves lives and um, invite us, invite us to your, your programs, your, your, uh, your training, your, um, your department, and we'll, we'll have conversations. So that is what I have for you. Um, I would love to, I'm going to stop my screen here, I think, and um, I'm going to make a little bit more space here for you to answer, uh, ask within the next few minutes here, any, any questions, any comments, any, any, anything um, that you might have that I can be of help for, or my colleague Jonathan can be of help with you around how we work together to support your students and you, because you're a huge part of this, you all. Um, and I know as a parent, it's really hard as you're typing in really hard, like, how do I support my kid without being a helicopter, right? Like, it is a balance, isn't it? Like, helping them kind of figure this out on their own and you playing a role and my kids at a different stage and age and developmental and how do we do this in a way that's most supportive and all and it's not easy. Oh my goodness, it is not easy. So we're here for you and help you figure it out and we'll help you figure out your own individual um, situation. Diane, I have a question that I think may be helpful for you to talk to families about. Um, when, say my student does go through the conduct process, mm -hmm. what is the best way for me to follow up and to make sure that the message was heard um, as they're going through that process? That's so great. So please know that if your student does have to go through that conduct process arc, we have such caring and loving people who are also going to hold your students accountable because that is part of learning and growing, right? Is accountable. We're also going to hold your student appropriately accountable. They're not going to get kicked out of school for having an open container of beer down the hallway, right? We're going to hold them appropriately. Now, depending on what happens, all right, there's a larger range of holding them appropriately accountable. But so know this, right? I have watched my colleagues in Jonathan's office actually ask students to leave the university for a while because it's not safe for them or others in a beautiful, compassionate, and accountable way. And here's what you need to do to get support and come back. Um, so what you can do is, as parents and caregivers and family members and supporters is ask them, like, so what happened? How was that for you? What were your takeaways? Um, what is something you'll do different? And, you know, if you don't understand it, please call us. If you have questions or are angry at us, like, call me. I am not going to tell you about your student necessarily, but I can answer um, some general questions or whatever to be on the same, because the point is to be on the same page. I'm pissed and my student has to go to that basics program and blah, blah, blah. And I could be like, oh, it would be really great here. Let me tell you what it's about and what we're doing and how we're helping support your student to kind of explore the role that substance has in their life and in their day to day and, and how to not have some negative things happen. Um, and that's what we're here to do. We're helping them explore their values and how they make decisions based on their values. Um, so what you can do is ask them about it, ask some open-ended questions. Um, what was that like for you? What did you learn? From, what were your takeaways? What did you learn from that? What is something you'll do differently? It's a great question. Um, how will you you know, not get in trouble again is a great question. What will happen if you continue to use substances in the way that you are doing? What might happen? You know, helping them kind of, it's hard for them to see the future a little bit, but what might happen if you don't make any changes? Those are all really great open-ended questions to ask your student. And so and I would also ask, to to yeah, yeah, I would also just ask, I think one of the questions we often hear from families is, is if my student is kind of going down a path that I am not happy with, where do I step in? How do I utilize the university resources to kind of help them get on track? Like what, what are my options there? Yeah, that's a really uh, great question as well. And if it has to do with substances, um, I have, I, I do have parents and caregivers calling me 
Um, if you are concerned about your student, what I can say from um, my years of being here is that you're right on. I have not had a, a parent caregiver call me yet who was totally off. In fact, what you usually see, unfortunately, is the tip of the iceberg. And there's usually a lot more under there. So if you are concerned, oh my goodness, please reach out so that we can talk through together a plan for you and your students. A lot of times, um, and so that we can also, so that I can also check in that you're getting uh, support for yourself because that last slide about family members being impacted, you are impacted too by your child's use. Um, again, I, it's really hitting home, sorry, because I did just come from tomorrow, right? Um, <clears throat> so, uh, so reaching out a lot of times with parents and caregivers, I'm making sure that they get support. And also we're like, you, if you're paying the bill, you can say, I want you to go to see Diane in the basics office at least one time, right? And what will happen is those students will go, even if they're like reluctant, they will come and I will meet your student lovingly where they're at. And we will talk with them. And a lot of times they'll come back. Um, most times they will give me permission that yes, you could tell my parent that I came. And that's usually all you want to hear because you do have some level of trust in us that are working really hard and show up every day to work for your students. Um, that usually you're good to know, like, I just want to know that my kid made it to somebody who then is looking out for them and I can share the other resources, right? So if you're not sure what to do, um, I'm going to put my direct number in the, uh, my direct, um, uh, I obviously can't type and talk at the same time. This is my office number. You are welcome to call me at any time. Um, and we can chat about it. My computer will ring because we don't have phones anymore for some reason. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, you can also, I mean, there's other places that you can check in on campus. Um, and, uh, but it, having at least one place to know if it's substances and then if it's, or a lot of times when we do new student orientation and stuff, it's like, if you make a connection with like one person through that, if you, if you made a connection with me, great. And if it's about something else and I don't know the answer, I will help get you to the next right person, right? Um, to, to make the, the next connection. So um, if you have a connection with a staff person and can reach out to that, if it's about something other than that, and I don't know, I will absolutely get you connected to the right person. Um, so reach out to us. Um, the Dean of Students Office, um, they, they y'all do amazing work. I'm not just saying that because Jonathan's on the phone here. I'm saying that because I've worked with them um, personally, professionally for many years. And we are, honest to goodness, we have colleagues that come to work every day because they care about your students um, and they care about you. Reach out so to Diane, us. So mm Diane, -hmm. if there's only one thing that folks remember, what do you want them to remember? Um, your students care what you have to say, you set examples. If there's something that's not right, no matter what it is, you know your kid better than we do. If you are worried and concerned about your child, your student, please reach out to us. We care, we are here, keep talking to them. Even if they're rolling their eyes and giving the whatever, um, talk to them, talk with them, talk with them, with them, with them, be curious, keep an open mind. Sorry, this is more, but it's actually all under the same umbrella. And if you are worried, you know them better than us. And we will do everything in our, in our power to support your person. Well, thank we you so much. Thank Any you. final words for folks? Thank y'all so much for being here today. Thank you for attending. Um, and um, as always, this is part of our, our family you chat series. And so we'll make this available for you all to um, rewatch the recordings, um, to share with your students, whatever you may uh, decide to do with it. But we are so grateful that you're here. And thank y'all for participating. And Diane, thank you for being here and sharing such great information. You're welcome. Thank you so much for the folks who are here and for staying. Thank you. <laughs> Even if you're doing something else, you stayed on the screen. So thank you. <laughs> Your names were still here. So thank you. <laughs> right. Thank you, Jonathan. All right. Goodbye, everyone. All right. Take care, everyone.